Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. It is truly good to be here in the house of the Lord on Easter Sunday. It's good to see all of you. Uh, I would encourage you to make yourselves comfortable in here. Uh, feel free to avail yourself to coffee over there, um, um, any free resources, anything like that. Um, but it, indeed, we, we are here because the long wait is over. Uh, the fast um, has, has ended. We are at the day of joy uh, because this is the true story of the world that we all live in. Uh, that the power of sin could not hold Jesus. Uh, the power of death could not hold him. Uh, but he was found to be worthy of these things, and he rose again. And so we, no matter how we feel coming in this room, can say that is the true story of my life, and we are free to have joy. And we're doing this not just to remember that Christ has done this in the past, but this is also a day on Easter that we look forward to a new day, that just as Jesus was raised from the dead before, he will surely come again, and all weight of suffering and death will be gone. Uh, forevermore. I uh, hope you got one of these worship folders. This will um, give everything you need uh, for worship this morning, song lyrics, um, uh, passages of scripture to read, anything in bold print, then we are all invited to read together. Um, I want to keep announcements brief this morning, although as usual I want to um, uh, remind you that there's an announcements page in the back here that will keep you apprised of things going on today. Uh, particularly right after worship, then we are having an Easter brunch at the Kipps house. We would love to see you there. Even if you didn't RSVP, please come. This is our day that we can all be together and have fun. Um, next week, we'll start um, our discipleship hour at 9 a.m. again. Um, and there's an Easter egg hunt for kids coming up um, next week um, that we would I would encourage you to go ahead and pay attention to. Uh, but for now... Uh, let's flip back to the front of the worship folder as we move into worship. And I put these words in front of us um, that we have for a call to worship, which are all words of joy. And we're going to take just a moment to be quiet, um, to get ready to come before the Lord to worship. But as we have these words to meditate on, I would encourage you on this day to mostly gear your thoughts towards the good news that Jesus has provided for you. And even just list in your head the many, many things that we have, uh, that we have been given in Jesus Christ and that we have to take joy in today as we move uh, into worship. So let me put that before you. Let's be quiet for just one moment and I'll call us to worship in just a second. Let me invite us all to stand together and please join with me in the bold printed text. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if Christ is risen indeed, there is nothing else we can do than to give you thanks and to give you worship. So we ask that you would send your spirit into our midst this morning. Help us to taste and to treasure the joy of the good news of the gospel. We ask that all the things that have been prepared would serve you in that purpose and that you would loosen our tongues to worship you in truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing together.
scripture reading from this morning comes from Psalm 16, 1 through 11. This is God's word. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hands are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand together and sing. Okay. Let's confess our sins together. We'll use this confession here, saying together, Everlasting God, fountain of all life, and the true home of every heart, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Yet we confess 
that our hearts are enslaved by selfish passion and base desire. We seek after many things and have neglected the one thing we need. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. Loving Father, who alone can fill our deepest longings and quiet our restless hearts, help us to turn to you and find forgiveness. Lead us home that we may again find in you our life and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now these words of the assurance of grace that God extends to all. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. Let's stand and sing and thanks for the forgiveness that Jesus Christ wins for us. remain standing and join our voices together with all the saints throughout all times and all places and declare to all creation the good news of our God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to move into a time of prayer of thanksgiving and petition. I will be led in by singing the Lord's Prayer, and then Miles Gresham will come and offer further prayers, uh, focusing on the petition that God's name would be hallowed. So let's sing together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in is not here but has risen with these words everything changes father on this day we celebrate your greatest act of redemption bringing victory over sin death and satan we celebrate forgiveness of our sins purchased for us by christ at the cost of his own life we celebrate new life in christ as we are raised with him in resurrection and we celebrate the creation of a new worshiping and witnessing community against whom even the gates of hell cannot prevail Truly, Father, hallowed be your name. Father, because we are united with your Son, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have invited us to come boldly to your throne of grace with our needs and desires. Father, thank you for the women of Red Mountain Church and their commitment to knowing more of you. Please continue to use the women's Bible studies to deepen their walk with you and build their relationships with one another. Please give wisdom to our deaconesses and shepherdesses as they assist the elders and deacons in caring for your people and the needs of the community. Father, we thank you for the ministry of our sister church, Mount Brook Baptist. Thank you for their many years of faithfully proclaiming the gospel. Please be with their pastors and their deacons as they seek wisdom in leading their church. Father, we thank you for our sister, Elisa Fister, and for the work that you have called her to in Burundi. We ask that you would grant her wisdom and leadership at the hospital and with teammates. Give her success in her work as a pediatrician and a teacher. Please help the medical students and residents to understand the gospel and how it impacts their daily lives and for her ministry team as they develop relationships with new Burundian leaders. Father, for so great a salvation provided for us by the death and resurrection of Jesus and for the access to your throne of grace that you've provided for us, we can truly say, Hallowed be your name. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Miles. And a happy Easter to you all. Our happy children can be dismissed to teach me to worship. Through those double doors, if you could. If I have an adult back there, if you could divert children to go all in the same place. That's where we need them. All things properly in good order because we are Presbyterian after what? After all. 
Uh, last week we kicked off, hold on, let me say hi. Uh, my name is Charles Johnson. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if we haven't met yet, then please come up and say hi to me. If I haven't seen you in a while, please come up and say hi. I'd love to make your acquaintance. It is good to be able to look out and see you all here celebrating together on Easter morning. It's good that the Lord has gathered us here in such a way. Uh, last week, we kicked off Holy Week by beginning a short series looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is part of a letter that was written by Paul to a young church in the city of Corinth. And if you read this letter, what you're going to find is that this is a church that was dealing with all kinds of issues. Uh, they had moral problems. They had social problems. They were arguing about just about everything. They were arguing about marriage. They were arguing about divorce. The list goes on and on and on. And what you'll see if you read this letter, you'll see the ways that Paul writes to them. It's like a, it's like a master class in gospel ministry. Because what he doesn't do is give them a bunch of rules, or give them a bunch of new do's and don'ts. What he does is he returns them over and over and over again to the fundamental gospel principles that Christ died for the unworthy and Christ rose again, the promise of salvation, showing how these fundamental gospel principles apply even to the most complex issues. We never graduate from these things. In 1 Corinthians 15, when we get to chapter 15, what he's doing is he's arguing against a bunch of teachers that have infiltrated the church, teaching that it wasn't necessary to believe in Christ's resurrection, both Christ's resurrection and the future resurrection of God's people, the thing that we're celebrating this morning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at it and we're going to talk about the strengthening effect that staring at Christ's resurrection has on us, not just for our future, but for our day to day. Let's look together. This is 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read verses 12 through 28. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all most people to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Oh, Father, I pray that you would help us to look to you now, uh, the one who sent his son to die for us and to rise again. We pray that you would give us a chance to glimpse the power that you are promising to us in this passage. And, oh, Jesus, I pray that you would be among us as our peace, uh, the one who served us, I pray, Father, that, or I pray, Lord Jesus, our King, that you would help us to look to you now. 
And Holy Spirit, please be at work in this room. Please, God, my heart as I preach, I pray that you would guide all of our hearts, uh, taking this writing and writing it into our hearts, helping us to trust it. Teach us the gospel again, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, uh, I was vacationing with my family, and we were in a nice cabin, not a nice cabin, it was a good cabin, uh, on the Cumberland Plateau, somewhere in eastern central Tennessee, and one of the highlights of this cabin was that it was rustic in all the right ways, and it had this massive back deck that overlooked the valley of the plateau, just an incredible view. And, uh, of course, all four of us were there. My two boys and Shonda were there. And my sister's family was there. And she has two boys that are our boys' age. And so whenever we get together, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an amalgamation of boy energy is what it is. And uh, the favorite thing for them wasn't the hiking or the fishing we did or the adventures. It was the back deck. And not just the back deck, but the massive Jenga tower that was on the back deck. If you're not familiar with this game, it's a, a tower of blocks and you, the goal is to pull the blocks out of the middle and lay them back on top. And so the whole thing gets taller and more sta- or less stable as you go. Uh, you can understand why this is such a delight to a little boy because you're building something and knocking it down all at the same time, right? And all that was great. It was all great. It was wonderful. Until the sound of that huge tower made of two-by-four blocks falling on that back deck started to get to you. It started great, and then it was just so loud you couldn't hear anything else. Over and over and over again, boys laughing, the, the inside of us starting to die as adults. I mean, it was just rough. If you were trying to take a nap, you were out of luck. We dropped things. I saw birds fly out of the trees. I was fishing, uh, I, I was getting some quiet, I went fish, fly fishing not far away, and I'm not kidding, I'm standing alone on a river, and I could hear, and I'm convinced that I didn't catch any fish that day, because it was sending these subterranean signals, you know, scaring all the fish away. When Paul writes this letter to First Corinthians, to, the, to these Corinthians, he is hearing that Jenga tower come down. He is hearing people remove the block of the resurrection from their faith. And he is warning them that if you do, the rest, the rest of everything we believe falls apart. That's the block that you do not move. And not only that, but it's also the one that you stare at. Because behind it lies so much hope. And he makes two arguments in this passage. The first one is he outlines some of the immediate costs that we feel in the day-to-day and in the lives that we lead uh, for not believing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our future resurrection is a part of our faith. He outlines the immediate cost. And then he gives us an eschatological argument. He, he, He talks about the future gain that we have. Uh, and how that strengthens us for our day-to-day. So the immediate cost and the future gain. That's what we're talking about this morning. Uh, first, the immediate cost. Paul gives a litany of, uh, of what we lose when we take the resurrection out of this gospel equation. And he begins with his own credibility. He says uh, in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain. What Paul is saying is that you can't trust me anymore. Uh, This is all very, very personal to Paul. Uh, And he goes even further in verse 15. He says, if this isn't true, then we're we're misrepresenting God. Basically, if you take all of this out, then you you can't trust anything that I've said to you. Um, And uh, and because not only do you lose Paul's credibility, but you also empty the gospel of all of its promises. This is what he means when he says that uh, not only was my preaching in vain, but your faith is in vain. uh, My words to you are emptied, but also all of your faith in the gospel is emptied. Um, And uh, in verse 16, he says, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, what happens? Your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now, this is a big deal. 
Because the promises of the gospel are wide and far-ranging. But they all find their roots in this first promise that it is possible to find forgiveness with God through faith in Jesus Christ who pays for our sins on the cross. And what Paul is saying is that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead on Sunday, then there was no atoning sacrifice on Friday. You see, the resurrection of Christ, which Christians think of as a historic event, something that that really happened in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is like this receipt that God hands us that says the debt has been paid. It's this concrete, material thing that we can look to for a reassurance that indeed our sins have have truly been forgiven. And, and, And if we lose that, then the effect of it, as Paul says, is just an immense pressure that we feel in the day-to-day and that we feel in our lives. Verse 19, Paul tells us it means that we have hope in this life only. We're, of all people, most to be pitied. If there is no resurrection, then what it means is that this life is all there is. And if we're to be happy or sad, if we're to have something to celebrate or have something to give to those we love, then it's got to happen now. Every moment is important. Every day is important. If this life is all there is, then we're the ones responsible for our joy. And that is just an immense pressure. And many of us feel that pressure. We can feel that pressure from within and we can feel that pressure from without. Some of you are fans of Seinfeld. Uh, I am one of you. I know there's a bit of a generation gap in terms of who likes Seinfeld and who doesn't, but I'm going to risk it. And one of my favorite things about Seinfeld is that it introduced me to a man named Wayne Knight. Wayne Knight played Newman on Seinfeld, and Newman was Jerry Seinfeld's nemesis. And there's this classic scene where Newman is hanging out with George and Jerry and Kramer, and, uh, and at some point, George looks at Newman and says, what do you do? What do you do for your, life, for your living? And Newman looks at him and says, I'm a U.S. Postal Service worker. And of course, George asks him, why, why is that work so hard? Why is it that I hear stories that, uh, post, of postal service workers going crazy? And it was like Newman went to a dark place, you know? Like only he, only Wayne Knight can make this funny. But he said, because the mail never stops. It never stops. It's relentless. It keeps coming and coming and coming, and you got to get it out. And the more you get it out, the more that keeps coming. What is that? That's pressure from without. And we feel that pressure, don't we? Voices asking for more all the time. Kids in here, I know you feel that pressure. I know you feel that pressure at school. More being asked of you. I know we can all feel that pressure at home. I know that we can all feel that pressure at work. Wherever we go, there's pressure from without us, just asking for more and more and more. But I don't think any of those voices can match the internal voice. The one that's exerting pressure from within. There's a great comic, Charlie Brown is talking to Linus, and he goes up to Linus and he says, Linus, I have a new philosophy in life. And Linus says, oh, what's that? And Charlie Brown says, I'm only going to dread one day at a time. (laughs) And that's funny. We can laugh at that, but we know what he means, don't we? The internal voice that says, I have to keep giving. I have to have more. The internal voice that says, it's on me to take whatever I have, whatever I was born with, and turn it into something that manufactures joy. Joy for for me and joy for the people I love. That's the internal voice. That is immense pressure. If this life is all there is, that is an immense pressure. And one of the things I want you to see, because I, I know that in this room I'm talking to a bunch of people, many of whom do believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do believe it. But it is very easy for us to live as if 
We don't, functionally. It is very easy for us to buy into all of that pressure that comes from within or without. And I, and I want to tell you that Paul doesn't want the Corinthian Christians to feel that pressure. I don't want you to feel that pressure. I don't want that pressure for myself. I feel it all the time. But most importantly, Jesus does not want you to feel that pressure. It is not something, it is not a burden that we are fit to carry. And that is why we find so much life in the next three words that Paul writes at the beginning of verse 20. But if not, but, sorry, but in fact. See, he frames it as a fact. Uh, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And this is where he is moving from that short-term or immediate cost of not trusting the resurrection to outlining for us the future gain that we have because the resurrection is true. And so what I want you to do is notice what Paul is doing here. He is telling us that all of our day-to-day, -day, all of our day-to-day -day difficulties, and they are real. I mean, we wouldn't want to make light of those. Those are real. He is saying that all of the angst, all of the heartache, all find their resolution in the hope that we have in Christ. When I got married um, to Shonda, I, we sang a, a hymn at our wedding, and it has become my favorite hymn called Great is Thy Faithfulness. Many of you know it. Uh, I would sing that hymn every Sunday with you if Jeff let me. And, and the reason is, is because there's a lyric in that hymn that I can't shake. It talks about strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here, but he's setting it in reverse order. What he's saying is that we can have strength for today because we have bright hope for tomorrow. Our hope for tomorrow gives us great strength for today. How does that work? Well, because what he's saying is that when God lifts Jesus from the grave, he was beginning something remarkable. Verse 20, he calls it the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus rising from the dead is the first fruits. Now, what, it, what does first fruits actually mean? Well, first of all, just the language of that word implies that there will be later fruits. There'll be second fruits and third fruits. Uh, but when it was harvest season, what the people would do was that they would look at the very first crops that came up sometime around Pentecost. And they would go to the temple and they would offer their first fruits to God. And they would trust that God was only going to continue to supply their need. That was one. Jesus is offered to God as the first fruits. And so it invites trust that the rest of the har harvest will come in. But also you could look at your first fruits and it would tell you about the quality of the rest of the harvest. So if you had high quality sheaf of grain or whatever, if it was exactly what you were hoping for, then you would be able to trust that the rest of the harvest was coming in and it would too would be bountiful. It was this indicator. And so what Paul is telling us is to look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, the perfect spotless righteousness. Look at Jesus right now ascended into heaven with a glorious body sitting at the right hand of the Father and you will get a glimpse of what is coming for you. Jesus is the, the first fruits. And we also know, because Paul is going on to lay out a timeline of all the things that follow the resurrection. Did you see that? First, Christ is resurrected from the dead, and then he says a number of things will follow that. All things must be in order. That, that, that word order that he uses in verse 23 could be translated turn. So he's saying first this, then this, and then this. Um, he is talking about the order in which these things will happen. First, Christ the first fruits. That's what we look back on and we remember that it happened and we trust it. And then at his coming, all those who belong to Christ will be re uh, resurrected. Did you hear that word, belong? All those who belong to Christ. 
Heidelberg number one, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're, if, you, if you're in Christ this morning, if you're looking to him with faith, trusting his resurrection and your future resurrection, then what Paul is saying is that you belong to him, all of you body and soul, belong to him. And then verse 24, it says, then comes the end. Not only is Jesus beginning something remarkable, but he's also ending something remarkable. Jesus will destroy every rule and authority and every power, everything that opposes God. Our our, uh, catechism tells us that When we look to Jesus as our king right now, we trust him as one who defends us from all his and our enemies. That's the language of the catechism. But what this promise promises us is that there's coming a time, at the end of time, when Jesus returns to us, when not only does he defend us, but he eliminates them altogether, including what we call the last enemy. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. Uh, I think it was about a week ago, my father sent me an article out of The Economist of a, a woman in Spain. It's, it was titled, The Long Living Spaniards. And apparently there is a woman in Spain who earlier this month just celebrated her 117th birthday. Just amazing, just amazing. Uh, But apparently it's not, uh, I mean, it's a little amazing, but it's not as amazing as we think of it because in the area that she lives in, in Spain, apparently people live longer. And some people think that it's because of the diet, like what they eat. Uh, But Maria, what her, her name is Maria Brañas. And what she thinks is that it has everything to do with good connection with family and friends, that she grew up with family and friends and that that extends her life. And, and the data backs her up. The, 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 the studies on this say that uh, time with family and friends can actually add days, add, you know, add years to your life. Uh, apparently, there's a lot of research that's been going on in recent years about this, uh, about the longevity of human lives. The New York Times just put out a, an article in the past week where it talked to a scientist in Italy uh, who, who looks very young. <laughs> He actually looks very, very young for his age, and, uh, and he, he thinks that it has everything to do with what we eat. You know, if we eat better, uh, if we're more disciplined about our eating, then, then we can add years to our life. And, and I don't know, he, maybe he was being tongue-in-cheek uh, when he said this, but he actually said that if he eats the right foods, he thinks he can live to be 120 or 130 years old, as we said. Make, make, with, make of that what you will. But I want you to notice the Im- implicit thing that's also being stated. Is that not even the most confident, uh, not even the most intellectually curious, are willing to make the claim that death could be escaped. But you know who did? Jesus made that claim. In John chapter 6, Jesus gives us a mission statement. And he says, I have come to do the will of my Father in heaven. And this is his will, that I should lose none of the people that he has given to me. All those who belong to him. And I will raise them up on the last day. That's his promise to you. Now, I don't think anything tests our hope like death does. I don't think anything moves us to tears quicker. I don't think anything makes us question our futures more. Death truly is our last enemy. And so there is no gift so precious, uh, no promise so profound as Jesus has promised to lose none of his people and raise them up on the last day. Death does not get to have the last word 
Jesus does, and his word is life with him forevermore. And so I want to ask you the same question that Paul was asking these Corinthians in church. Is, do you believe that? Do you trust that that's true? Because if you do, it can be a source of immense strength. Every day, the hope of it can be a source of immense strength. Every day, for the rest of your lives. This is something uh, that was brought home again to me this past week uh, by a man who has become a, a real hero of mine. Um, some of us remember, I think it was Wednesday. Wednesday marked one year since the terrible shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee. It was just awful, terribly sad day. And I know some of you have uh, friends that were there, some of you lost family that was there. I, I know. It was terribly sad. And one of those was the senior pastor's daughter, a little girl named Hallie Scruggs, nine years old. And her father, Chad Scruggs, um, <clears throat> has become a hero of mine, if for nothing else, and he's still, pastor he's still pastoring. He's still pastoring at that church. He is still walking into the building where his daughter was killed, and he is still proclaiming the ministry of the gospel. And I, I, I don't think anybody would have blamed him if he just said, I need to take some time. I don't know if I can keep doing this. I don't know if I can keep walking into this building. Where does that kind of strength come from? Well, if you looked at the funeral, uh, you, would have, you would get an understanding why. Um, <clears throat> it was a beautiful funeral, the church was packed, the gospel was preached, and this father, who had just lost his little girl, stood up to do two things. To remember Hallie well, to remember Hallie well, and to proclaim the hope of the resurrection. And he said shortly after his daughter died, he, he wrestled with all those questions. Uh, he said he didn't know how he could ever walk into that building again, how he could keep driving up the hill, walk in, have an office there. But he said that over time that God impressed on his heart that he must because evil cannot win. And so he said, even at the funeral, he said, even having the funeral in this building is our protest. That evil does not get to win, that the powers of darkness do not win. That's strength. And then hope. He said, I will never get to walk her down the aisle. But she is forever with the groom to whom we unreservedly dedicated her. And we are convinced there is no husband more perfect than him. Strength for the day. Hope for tomorrow. And so I ask you, Christian... What is your only hope in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. O oh, you who gave yourself for us, O oh, you who loves us, O oh, you who rose again and promises life, help us look to you uh, in love and in joy, uh, trusting you with our whole lives and our whole hope. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's we'll stand and we'll sing together.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord God. It is good and right to do so. With joy, we praise you, gracious God, joining our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. If you're helping to serve communion, will you please come forward? Uh, we come forward at Red Mountain to receive the Lord's Supper. Three stations one here, right under those speakers, one here in the center. And uh, one station's over there right at the foot of those steps. Just go to the one that's closest to you. But do keep an eye. This line tends to back up a good bit, and it probably will this morning. And so if that's the case, just slide over to the next one as you're able. We also enjoy the practice of, uh, of blessing children. So there are many in this room that haven't made a public profession of this, their faith and, uh, and become a member. And so... If that's you or if that's your child, then come forward anyway and, and uh, ask the elder who's serving the wine to say uh, a quick prayer over your child. We, we really enjoy doing that. And if you would like prayer for you or a loved one, then feel free to ask the elder who's serving the wine to do that. As we come to this table, it's a table that tells us a story, a good story. The best of stories is the table that tells us that Christ died for our sins. And that we stand at this table of forgiven people. God, welc Jesus welcomes us around the table, providing elements uh, that remind us of just what he did for us. This bread tells us of his body broken on the cross. And uh, this uh, wine tells us of his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. But it also tells us of the promise of the resurrection that we live with every day. That there, it is pointing to a future day when we will gather with God's people, with Jesus himself physically present at the table, eating and drinking together. The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the day that we look forward to. This is a, a table that tells us of the story of our faith. And if this is your faith, if you look to Jesus with eyes of faith, trusting him and him alone for uh, his sacrifice on the cross, as the only thing that justifies you in the eyes of God, then Jesus looks back at you and says, you are my people, you belong to me, come and eat and drink at this table. But if this is not your faith, I'll tell you, we are so happy that you are with us this morning, uh, but we would ask that you would allow these elements to pass you by. Let me pray for us, and then we'll eat and drink together. Uh, oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will be amongst us, uh, working in us through the taking of this meal, that you would take these ordinary elements, this ordinary bread, and this ordinary wine, and use it for the extraordinary purpose of nourishing your saints for our growth and grace. Show us Jesus again, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks for it. And he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he also took the cup, and he poured it out for his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. And the Apostle Paul tells us that every time we eat this bread and every time we drink from this cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes back for us. Amen. And so all those who bear the name of Christ with grateful hearts, come, taste, and see that the Lord is good.
Let's stand and pray the prayer after communion together. Renewed now with heavenly bread, by which faith is nourished, hope increased, and love strengthened, we pray, O Lord, that we might hunger for Christ, the true and living bread, and strive to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Extend your hands to receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May you go in peace. <laughs>